Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever the heck you are, whatever you're doing, I'm so glad you're with me. Today we're talking about extreme humanism. Does it matter? Is it possible? Who cares? Hey, today I'm talking to someone who not only believes it matters, but has built his life to work on it. It's Tom Peters, and I'm so excited to talk to Tom. Tom is with me today. He's got a new book out that is fantastic. I got it right after they finished the format, Tom. So congratulations. It's a beautiful Thanks. book, and it's good to see you again, my friend. Well, the, the only the only problem I have with seeing you, Phil, is that? I just this morning, an hour ago, finished the last edits of the dust jacket, and I thought, F, 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 give me a little break. So I finished the dust jacket, and literally at five- Here you are. And, and now here we go with the next round. It is a great <laughs> pleasure to be with you again, mainly. Yeah, mainly, right? So cool. Well, I'm- I'm excited that you're here and glad to talk to you because I have been I've been following your work for anybody who doesn't know who Tom Peters is you're missing out. In Search of Excellence came out feels like a thousand years ago, but it is as relevant then as relevant today I mean as it was then and this book matters even more right the heck now. So Tom, why I mean at 78 man, you you don't have to do anything else, right? You you've accomplished so much. So why did you have to write this book now? Because I'm pissed off. About what? <laughs> and what I'm pissed off about is, as I have said, to understand my message, you have to have a certificate of graduation from the third grade. It is not very sophisticated. It doesn't take physics. It doesn't take calculus. The other thing I've said is I said, look, you know, we can all use a few more bucks. Love to have your royalties but I've written 19 books and every single one of them has said exactly the same thing. And, you know, I hope you bought all 19, but the, you know, the, the, the point, I mean, but the real asterisk on that, and you said it implied it in your introduction is all this quote unquote stuff, people first, et cetera, uh, as of last February or March when the pandemic came, and as of the middle of the year, when we began to really see the extent of racial injustice, it's 10 times more important now, or that's, who knows, it's, it's much more important. Um, and, and it is a repeat, uh, but it's only 83.5% a repeat, because before we had the pandemic, before we had the racial injustice uh, intensity thereof introduced to us, we had artificial intelligence coming at us. And there were a couple guys from Oxford, a couple profs from Oxford who wrote a book uh, two or three years ago, and it said 50% of American white collar jobs will be at risk to AI within 20 years. And some people said that's extreme. Some people said it's not extreme enough. Uh, but on top of everything else, we've got the potential AI wipeout. Uh, and so all of that is piled on top of each other. And I am naive enough to believe that if you and I started a company and we ended up eight months later with six of the most fabulous employees known to humankind, and if we created a show together that was unlike any show that's ever been created before. And it was more human and more energetic that, you know, that we, we won't be completely done in. Uh, and on the done in front too, there's another thing which, which, which I like to point out. AI is coming down the road. AI is gonna give us a whack in the side of the head that may be more extreme than even what happened when the robots came to the GM plants. Uh, but guess what? It's not going to happen overnight. And it may be horrible, horrible, horrible in 15 years from now. But first, you got to get through the 15 years. And, you know, literally, we there's this saying that I have, and I really wanted it to be the title of the book, except I like the one we came up with. And the saying is, excellence is not an aspiration. Excellence is not a hill to climb. Excellence is the next five minutes or nothing at all. 
And so this inner, the, I've got a big life. I've got the puppy dog who has bad eyes. I have depressed friends, everything else in the world. But, and this has kind of been uh, secret is the wrong word. One, one of my secrets. Uh, and that is my entire human life for 78 years is all on the line in this conversation. You know, F this up and I've F my entire life up. And, and literally it is, you know, it, it really, I, I remember reading this thing and it's so horrible. And there was a lot of, of drug overdose you know, involved. But when Robin Williams died, one of the things they said, I don't do drugs. So I didn't have that level of fear is they said Williams would do a one man show and people would not be clapping. They would be leaping out of their chairs and screaming at the top of their lungs. And he would walk off the stage and he'd have a smile on his face. And five minutes later, he was in the middle of the biggest depression known to humankind. And I'm pretty close to that. You know, I, as I said to somebody, I've done 28 or 2900 speeches and I haven't gotten one right yet. I'm stealing from Tom Hanks, actually. I think a few years ago, he said, I've never done better than a C plus in terms of what I've delivered in my movies. And, you know, it's kind of, that's kind of the way I'll give myself a little credit B minus maybe. Well, yeah. Well, I, I love that. I love that consistent desire to be excellent. And I love what you said about the next five minutes. I mean, the book is titled excellence now, not excellence in five minutes or, in five years or yeah. after AI or any of that crap, right? So I think that is a very appropriate title, right? Excellence right now. Like this is all we have, Tom. It's you and I right now for the next, you know, however long we talk and that's all we have. And then we have something next, but this is it. The now is it. And we have to be, you know, again, to steal your subtitle, right? we have to be extremely human with each other. We have to be- well, Let me, let me just other. interrupt because it's yeah. something that happened yesterday and it so, so supports your point. Uh, and I'm obviously not going to name the institution, but my wife is on a board and they're really working on in, inequality issues. And she said they've got great plans and it looks good and they can actually afford it. But nobody talked about what happens during the next year. It was this is how we're going to completely transform the institution. But she said, you know, very specifically, there's a consultant who's coming in to help them. And she said, we have a consultant who's coming in to help us on racial diversity. He was an old white guy. And, you know, I'm not arguing that every consultant has to be an African-American or anything like that. But, you know, to in 2021 to be assisted in a racial equality program with some old white fart in charge. I mean, it he may be the greatest in the world, but it. You know, as they say, the atmospherics are all wrong. He might come up with, you know, the most brilliant suggestions in the world, but it, it just feels wrong. You know, yeah. we're really engaged now. Now, you know, can you can you help us with the handicapped access because our consultant's coming in and he's 93 years old? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm being unfair on a million dimensions, but you know what I'm saying. Well, but that's but that's true, though, right? I mean, we have to put. Well, the, the optics do matter. If they didn't matter, nobody would notice them. I mean, the optics are real, man. And, and we, we so often overlook that. I mean, just common sensibly, if you're talking about how do we teach diversity, that likely should come from someone who's not just like you. Yeah. I mean, that's just common sense. I mean, that's common sense to me. And I think that when, you, when we stop, right, and we do focus, to your point, in the next five minutes, that's common sense to everybody. But the problem is we look out five years and we say, what do we want? Nobody gets fired for hiring IBM. Nobody gets hired, fired for hiring McKinsey. They do get hired for hiring somebody whose name they can't pronounce and they don't care enough to actually pronounce it right. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny in terms of some of the little things and I asked somebody and, and I'm, I'm right. Uh, despite the fact that it's 2021 and not because we haven't tried, but we still got a bunch of paper catalogs. Title IX is one of them and so on. And I think in the last six months, there has been really a big jump in terms of diversity in the people who are modeling the swimming suits and the pants and so on and so forth. 
Uh, and, and, you know, again, it's a little thing, but it's, it's, it's not a little thing. I mean, the only reason I realized it is obviously I thought, holy smoke, this is a, you know, contrast with, with the past. And so, you know, there are a million little, little uh, teeny things like that that can be done. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, one of those teeny thing, but big things is you talk about in the book, the importance of training. And as someone who does a lot of training and who has been through a ton of training and who training is near and dear to my heart with a lot of family members who are teachers, whether they're formal educators or not, that's so important to me. And you talk about the importance of a CTO, the chief training officer, not just technology officer. Talk to us about that, Tom. And where, where does that come from? Because I've not heard anybody else stress the importance of training. Yeah. Like you do. Well, jumping ahead in the story, I've said, and I'm talking to you, the CEO about training. And I said, you're not really buying my message. Would you please do me one of the following things? Call a police chief, call a fire chief, call a theater director, call a symphony director, call the guy who runs the nuclear power plant that's a few miles away from you, call a general, call an admiral, and ask them whether the hell training is important. You know, the, 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 the military is the classic example. Uh, you. I said to somebody in the average middle-sized company, the the training tr training person who is certainly not called the chief training officer is a mid-level manager. In the United States Army, the tr chief training officer is a four-star general. It's just as simple as that. And it, and it, you know, I mean, it, it, it's football teams, archery teams fire chiefs, police chiefs, school principals. And so first of all, it's not frigging weird to say training is important. That's number one. Number two, the whole premise of the book is that we can differentiate ourselves if our products and services and relationships are more human than they have been in the past. And in particular, you know, I talk a lot about design and design is, you know, pure, raw, unmitigated uh, humanism. So, and, and then there's the, you know, there's, and I feel bad about this. I didn't use the word, you know, do a word count on me. Do me a favor, don't. Uh, do a word count on my last books. How many times does the word community appear? Do a word count on my last books. How many times does the word moral responsibility appear? I believe that everything I've written about people, person, so on and so forth is a good and damn good example of responding to moral responsibility. But what I'm arguing here, and it's a little bit like what we were talking about, you know, with the old white guy doing diversity is I'm, I want to hear the word moral. I want to hear the word community. And, you know, right at the top of our list in the book, we're saying business has a moral responsibility. And one of the pieces of logic of that, which is not exactly rocket science either, is my people, the frigging business gurus, a term that I hate. Uh, you, look, you look through their books, our books, my books, uh, and I bet you 85% of the examples are Fortune 500 companies. And yet... The real reality is that 7% of us work for the Fortune 500. Business ain't the Fortune 500. It is, for example, the whatever it is, 13 million women-owned businesses in the United States. And so when people say business is different, I say, no, business is the community. It's the community because 98% of us are not, I don't know how many people the public sector employs, let's say 15%, 85% of the people in the world, including my next door neighbor, sure as hell doesn't have an MBA, God bless him, that's a big step forward, uh, but he's a business person and his wife is a business person. And so, you know, and, and, and I, I'm just, I'm, you know, back cover of the book says moral responsibility. Just finished editing the dust cover this morning, says moral responsibility. And, you know, obviously the, you know, I wrote, I wrote this thing, Phil, and I'm not going to read you many things. And I call it the seven commandments of leadership 
in the time of COVID-19. Be kind, be caring, be patient, be forgiving, be present, be positive, walk in the other person's shoes. Uh, and I really you know, think that is a lot of the story. But yeah, let's, let's stick with your question. Excuse my language, but shit, I don't know. It seems so obvious to me. You know, I, I've said to many people relative to myself, uh, I'm very often not the smartest person in the room, but there is no living human being on earth who can out prepare me. You know, and, and that's training as far as I'm concerned. And it's the all important last 98%. Uh, and, and I remember, and, and he had us not a great run. John Scully, uh, replaced Steve Jobs at Apple during a big shakeup 20 year or so years ago. And he wrote about autobiography. I remember reading in it, he said, we would say to people, uh, we can't promise you a job for five years. We can't promise you a job for a year. We can barely promise you a job for the next six months. But the one thing we can guarantee you is you will have had a better growth experience at Apple during those six months than you could have had anywhere else in the world. And you know, there's, there's another piece of it, and I don't think this is entirely because of my advanced age, but the New York Times columnist, David Brooks, uh, wrote a wonderful essay, and he called it Resume Virtues versus Eulogy Virtues. And the resume virtues are you know, I graduated from the University of Michigan. I got my MBA at Wharton. I was promoted six times in the first five years. I'm now sitting atop an organization of, you know, 273 people, uh, 273,000 people, 2,730 people, whatever. And he said, that's resume virtues. The eulogy virtues are, what do they say about you at your funeral? And what do they talk about? They talk about, was Phil a good guy? You know, did he go out of his way to just bend over a little bit and help people? And, and back to the next five minutes, I've said, you know, a eulogy virtue to me, you know, we had some snow in, in, in Boston. I think you guys had some snow in Florida too. Uh, we had some snow in Boston uh, a couple of days ago. And yes, it's all work from home, but let's just, it's assume it's a, you know, an office thing. To me, a virtuous thing is when you stop at a florist on the way to work and buy a big bunch of colorful flowers and bring them into the office and put them in a, in a vase somewhere. And it's just part of humanizing and increasing morale. And, and, uh, you know, and again, I, I think it's a criminal act if somebody leaves your company and they've only been on, per Scully, a three-month project if they're not better prepared for the future than they were when they walked in. I think it's, you know, if, if it was up to me, that would be a felony. Uh, you know, that's, that's, what you, that's what you do in this world. There was a, a great journalist by the name of Tim Russert. And when he died, uh, Peggy Noonan wrote, the eulogy in the Wall Street Journal. And she said basically what I just said. He said, she said, the amazing thing about, you know, he was, a, he was known as being tough. He didn't screw around with Russert if we're talking about corruption or war or whatever else it is. But she said, the thing, the thing about, the thing about Russert was he really loved people and helping people. And you could smell it. And, 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 you know, you know, which brings me to another thing and so on. Another thing that I've really focused on in, in this book is hire for EQ, promote for EQ. Uh, and I only 90% mean it because I don't necessarily mean Daniel Goldman's uh, emotional quotient test, but I mean EQ stuff. You know, there's one, one little example in the book about a, healthcare organization and they do at a high level not just the walk in and see if you're still alive uh home care and their entire industry 
has a turnover rate of about 70 percent. And they said, you know, this is just outrageous. And so they changed their hiring practice. And the hiring practice now is it's very nice that you have a degree from the University of Wisconsin or the University of Florida Gainesville. Uh, but how, how did you know, they, they have these quote unquote socials and, you know, it was six of us in a circle. Did Phil listen to the person ahead of him? Uh, and they said, and they said, one of the things we look for is examples of community service. You don't have to have been the head of the, you know, Red Cross in your community or to be a, you know, deacon in your church. I told you I'm going to cheat. Yep, Tom's going to cheat. So Tom is certainly concerned about who that might be. So we're going to take just a quick pause here, talk a little bit more about his book, right? It's Excellence Now, Extreme Humanism. He's got a lot of really great stuff that's in this book that you really can't find anywhere else, though it is kind of common sense. He just talked about his Leadership 7. Let me reshare that with you. The, they are important during COVID. They're important otherwise. Be kind. Be caring, be patient, be forgiving, be positive, be present, and walk in the other person's shoes. Super, super important stuff. Super, super important stuff that we all have to worry about. So Tom's back. Tom, the the was that the call you're waiting for? I answered the phone and interrupted you. It's like probably half the people who are watching us. Uh, I'm waiting for a call, which brings my appointment for a vaccine. And Phil, I love you dearly. But getting that shot ranks ahead of missing you for, you know, for, for one for one minute. So so there it is. You know, the, the other thing about be kind, be caring, be patient. It's the best damn way in the world to make money. You know, do all these things around the customer, do all these things in front of with your employees. Um, and, and, you know, it, You'll you'll have more loyal customers, more loyal employees. It's just, it. Why do I have to write the nineteenth book? I'm too damned old and say exactly the same thing I said in the other eighteen. You know, <laughs> down to the placement of the semicolons. You know, it's time to write a book, Tom. Okay, let's go to the Xerox machine. We'll Xerox the last one and you know hand it in. Uh, and and yeah, I, and when I get a question not from you, but in some of the uh, promotional podcasts we did for my last book, I got, honest to God, half the time somebody would say, well, Tom, you write a lot about people. And what I really want to say is <laughs> WTF is there to write else to write about? Uh, you know, the, and, and I, you know, I, I'm picky in this regard. Uh, I'm going to beat the hell out of you. If you tell me that people are the number one asset in your organization, people aren't an asset. They are Tom or Phil. You know, the, my, my, th my thing, is, and don't get me going on the two words, human resources. Uh, so I was an only child and my father, Frank Peters, uh, a few hours after the fact, walks into the, to the, um, you know, the room where my mother is, Evelyn Peters. And he looks at the baby and looks at her and says, Evelyn, finally, we have our own little human resource. He didn't say that. <laughs> I am not he a didn't. human resource. I am Tom. You are not an asset. You are Phil. And, and it's really, it's, I, I really don't. I really think that human resources, the term should be wiped off the map. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to hang this one up. Sorry. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. Hello? I, I'm in the middle of an interview. So lots of stuff cooking here. Tom is talking all about why it's important to not think of yourself as a human resource and not to call your employees that. So Tom, still not the conversation you wanted there. But we're getting closer, let's hope, right? With that telephone. <laughs> yeah, I'm 78 and I've got a pacemaker, for God's sakes. I'm a high, high risk person. Uh, it doesn't okay. matter. And, you know, you and I had a little, we had a dispute before this conversation went public. 
And that is, is the organization of the vaccination process shittier in Massachusetts than it is in Florida? And you just beat me up. You said, don't give me that crap. You want to see screwed up? Come down and visit me. Come here. Me. Yeah, come visit me, buddy. Yeah, but, anytime. Uh, anyway. Well, that's the human piece, though. I mean, you know, to that point, we joke about vaccines or whatever, but it comes down to human to human, right? I mean, if we really thought of the people getting the vaccines, giving the vaccines, distributing the vaccines, producing the vaccines, responsible for funding the, the vaccines, we saw them as other humans instead of just numbers. Yeah we'd have yep. a very different response than we would if we say, well, we've got a 217,000 dead and we've got you know only 117,000 vaccines. Just, I, I don't care about the numbers. I wanna know, did Tom get his vaccine? I mean, truly, to, to me, right, the most important person right now that gets the vaccine is you, man, right? That's and, it. And vice versa. And I'll go second, right? I mean, that's how it should be though. That's yeah. just such common sense. It's not, oh, Tom's one of a number. I don't care about the numbers. I care about my friend Tom Peters getting a vaccine and well, you know, Tom's the other wife thing getting that's a vaccine. Funny about this, it's not funny, uh, is I went to the grocery store an hour or so ago and checkout clerks in a grocery store are exposed almost as much as hospital workers. And the woman who was serving me before I left, I said, just stop for a minute. I want you to know how deeply I appreciate what you personally are doing. And she almost teared up a bit, but she almost teared up, Phil, because obviously, and I had a healthcare person say, she said, you know, you're the first patient who said that, you know, they've all said, be safe, be careful and so on. But she said, none of them have said, you know, this is an amazing nurse, nurse Phil. This is an amazing thing that you are doing by coming to work every day. And you didn't sign up for this. Uh, well, none of them meant it, though, either, Tom. Even if they care. said it, right, even if they said it, though, none of them meant it. I mean, I think that's the difference here. Because yeah. we've got so much check-the-box leadership, right? Oh, diversity. Okay, we hired seven black people. That's great. We're done with that. No, 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 stop. That's not the point, right? We have, we have three women leaders now. Oh, I have a black friend. I can't possibly be prejudiced. But Shut up. Like that's yeah. not it, right? I mean, that's the thing. We got to stop checking the box. We got to be present. It gets back to your five minutes point, Tom. Well, and for Who back are we to with the right now? Point for business people, hire for EQ. Damn it, or some equivalent thereof. I didn't finish the story. The people who started hiring less based on credentials uh, and more based on the yeah. sociability, their their turnover, and nobody's going to believe me. Uh, buy my book because you'll see it in print and then you might believe it. Turnover went from 70% to 1.7% in 18 months. Average number of hospital stays among their clients went down by 40% in the next 18 months. Uh, and, you know, and it's just, I, I read this horrible thing uh, in the Boston Globe, and it was from Mass General Hospital, which is one of the best in the world, da 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 da. Uh, and they'd done hard research. Nurses everywhere now uh, carry a tablet, and they're entering data. And they did the hard nosed measurement on this thing, and nurse to patient eye contact has gone down by 70%. And that's awful. Uh, you know, there's a wonderful book that came out, particularly for, well, not for everybody, but for our friends who are in healthcare. And it's called Compassionomics. And that sounds like taking something heavy and making it, you know, whatever. And that's the point. It's like, you can't evade this because the numbers are here. And it is the value of compassion in healthcare. And, you know, and these guys are, you know, I got a whole bunch of quant degrees. I'm pretty numerate. These guys are more numerate than I am. And they even have a number from one big experiment. And the number is 37 seconds. 37 seconds of doctor-patient contact will reduce the length of a hospital stay by 30%. 37 seconds. 
30, and, and you know, these guys are not bullshit artists. They are MDs with more statistical training than God, and they don't open their mouth until they've got enough data to sink a ship. But, you know, I, I think, you know, everybody I've given the book to is giving it to everybody that they know, and it's fabulous for healthcare, but it, you know, applies to everybody in every business and every organization known to, you know, known to humankind. Yeah. Well, and it, it, to your point before, it all seems so darn obvious. Like, this isn't that hard. Be present with who you're with. Look at them. Don't just check the box. Like, I've got my phone. I've got my tablet here. I'm with you, man. Right? Like, I'm here. I'm here with you. Yes, I'm looking at my notes right on my notebook. That's true. But I'm mostly here. I'm here, you know, okay, what are we What are we talking about, right? What, and, and so what happens, I think, to so many is we get so trapped in the other metrics and we forget about the people metric, right? We forget about that EQ. We forget that I want Tom to live longer, not society. I want Tom to live longer. Yeah. And I think that's the big miss. Is that what you're, is it, you think that's right or am I off? I think it's answer? right. And one of the things that I argue with a lot of data to support me is let's talk about a somewhat sizable organization. The most important people in a sizable organization are first line managers. And what I just said about hiring for EQ is times 100 in the promotion process. And, you know, that that's just absolutely positively, unequivocally. Google did this thing. It really made me feel good or validated or whatever. And it was utterly fascinating. They did a big long term Google quality study of their top employees and their top teams. Top employees, they identified eight factors uh, that were associated with top employees. The first seven were soft stuff. You know, you look, you look at the average Google team and the average IQ is 423 and every single one of them knows that they're the smartest human being on earth. And, you know, they said, what's, what's the best employees? They listen, they care, they appreciate diversity, diversity of all kinds, the race, yes, but all sorts of things. Uh, and then they did the, the same thing with teams and the most innovative teams. And Google is one of those insanely stupid places that qu classifies people as A players or B players, which is a great way to demotivate 50% of the population. And in terms of innovation, the B teams always beat the A teams. And it was for the same reason. Because in the B team, you know, both of us have IQs of 500, but in the B team, I was actually interested in what you had to say, Phil. Uh, you know, and, and, and it's, it's, and it's huge. And the other thing too, which is a googly thing, uh, is they said that one of the biggest factors in the teams was, which gets back to what I just said, no bullying and, you know, get together a bunch of 500 IQ software engineers and you will find it, uh, up the yin yang as they, as they used to say. Yeah. Well, any high performance. And another guy, it's another thing in the book when I do the hiring chapter. There's a guy who, who runs a, a, a biotech company uh, called Optinos. And he said, I love it that he used plain language. We only hire nice people. Uh, and he said, look, and this is the kind of the important asterisk. He said, half of the degrees that our people have, you can't even pronounce the degree. But he said, I don't care if it is a biostatistics, blah, 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 blah. He said, guess what? There are a lot of people out there who have that degree. Hire the nice ones and leave the jerks aside. That's not that hard, but yet no. it's often not done. And what, what you know, I, I guess I think part of that is another piece of your book that I think is so important is, and that is the disbelief that managing matters. You taught, you say clearly, the title of one of your chapters, Tom, is managing is the pinnacle, not the foundation, not kind of important, but the pinnacle of human achievement. And yet so many think that it's more important to lead than it is to manage or that yeah. managing is somehow crappy. So talk to us, Tom, about management and why that is so important. Like define it first, because I think that's important. Well, first I design it, define it as resume virtues versus eulogy virtues. 
Uh, managing it, 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 it's funny my wife and I before the pandemic used to spend the winter months North American winter months in New Zealand and I taught a little bit at the Auckland Business School and the one class I taught was all kind of 31 year old engineers and they are the smartest kids in the class and they had been brilliant but guess what happens if you're good at what you do within four years you're going to be managing a project maybe within 10 years two years and once that happens all you do is people it's not part of the story it is the story uh you know you don't solve the equations anymore you hire the best equation solvers. And, and, and the other part of it, I, I said, uh, and this was in a tweet or it was somewhere. And I said, I, yeah, it was a tweet. Some guy said, Elon Musk is one of the two most important people in the world. And my response was, I have great respect for Mr. Musk. Almost as much as I do for the truly committed second grade teacher who has changed the life trajectory of 25 kids every year for the last 20 years. She's my hero, number one. But I also believe, to go back to your question, that's the point of managing. You know, the, it was, well, it's, you know, we don't have, we don't have a million years when my mother taught the, they wanted to send me to a local private school and our entire net worth was about seven and a half cents on the good days. And so she went off and taught the fifth grade and she was tough, tougher than hell, but God was she, she humane. And at her memorial service, uh, you know, Tom Peters, one of the great speakers, gives the memorial speech for his mother. And it was just one of the most brilliant speeches, actually, in the history of humankind. So anyway, that's the first part of the memorial. Oh, God, Phil, I wish I had a video. When the service was over, the number of 40 to 50 year olds who came up to me and said, my fifth grade experience with your mother was one of the most significant things in my life development. And, you know, that just, I wept through that. She, she was, and again, which is, people get it all wrong. She was tough, tough as nails. She didn't cut anybody any slack, but she loved every one of them. And she was desperate for them to see. It's not, it's not like you gotta be soft. It's not soft, you know? And, 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 and I mean, I hate, hate that term, but it's, uh, you know, Back to the back to the Google. I mean, they, you know, there's another study that was done that showed that women were better managers than men, and the statistical significance, and they were better managers on 12 out of 16 attributes. And some the author said, a lot of these were the tough attributes that we attribute to males, like delivering on results. Well, guess what? Engage people who give a damn about what they do, deliver more on results. Doofus. Uh, but yeah, and I really I, I chose that pinnacle of human achievement term with the greatest of care. Uh, it wasn't meant to startle. It wasn't meant to do anything except as close as I can get to the I mean, and I, I said this one time to somebody is I said, you know, you're managing people, first line manager, second line manager, and you will change more lives for the better than the number one heart surgeon in the hospital 10 miles away. You know, God bless him. And, you know, the guy who put my pacemaker in, God bless him. God bless his training. God bless his tools. But in, tools. But in terms of life trajectory, uh, you know, Phil, the first line manager, or Phil, the second line manager, you get it, 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 and save in the best sense, you know, it's just, people are going to finish their two years with you and 
they're going to be better human beings and they're going to be incredibly well trained and they're going to care about the context in which they work. And, you know, and, it, and it's not theory. There's, you know, there's also research on first line managers and it's unbelievable. Highest productivity, lowest turnover, da, 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 da. Every damn variable known to humankind is number one dependent on the first line leader. It's pretty simple. And yet it's often not done, which I think, Tom, that's why you have to write 20 books on this, right? That's why you have to get up with your, you know, you, you absolutely get to that point there where you just have to keep saying it. I mean, your logo is a red exclamation point. There is nothing more obvious to me than a red exclamation point that says, like, do this now. This is not like optional stuff, right? Excellence now, extreme humanism now. Take the steps right now to care for your people before we have this, you know, before we have another pandemic or before you really need to. I mean, come on, folks. This is this is not that hard. I mean, you have a, a I, I want to shift just a smidge here because you talk about we didn't say the words kindness, but I think it's important. You give the formula kindness equals repeat business equals profit. And this is so not hard, but Tom, talk us through that because I think that's a super important uh, equation, way of thought. I don't know what else to call it for folks and put the damn exclamation points on each of those. So that yeah, we can really I mean, get. The, you know, the, I hope that you're not being kind in pursuit of profit, but if you are kind, your profit will be higher. And, you know, and the repeat, I repeat business thing is no business person makes any money from the first transaction. You have all the development costs, you have all the marketing costs and so on. What you make the money from is when Phil comes back the 15th time or 20th time or 30th time and does word of mouth or word of mouse or social media and tells everybody about the experience and repeat business comes from the soft factors. I mean, yes, you've got to have a good product or service, but it's the, it's the you know, it's, it's the way you're treated that's memorable and leads to recommending. To, I mean, you know, it's, it's hard to explain because it's so obvious. Uh, you know, I get the first business because it's a great product. I get visit, you know, repeat Well, I think it's, you know, it's, it's referability, right? I mean, I'm not going to refer a jackass. I'm going to refer somebody that I actually enjoyed working with. Right. And I think that's the big, that's the big miss many forget is in between results and business is kindness, is compassion is consideration, is this extreme humanism that you talk about, Tom. I think that's the big important piece here because extreme humanism is the glue that can hold your business together or it can be the thing that just rips you completely to shreds if your leaders don't have it, if your managers don't have it, if your salespeople don't have it, for heaven's sake, for your customers, right? It's people first, people always. And I think that's, you know, that... You said that in your first book, you're saying that now, 19 later. It's not that hard. Nope. Yeah. Doesn't, you know, as I said, got to have that graduation certificate from the third grade. And, yeah. you know, that's not a throwaway line. There's, no. uh, you know, I can, I can do the highest of math and, you know, that you'd ever find. I, you know, my father was mathematical, my grandfather was. I considered a 799 on the math boards to be a disgrace. Uh, and, but that's not why we're having this conversation. And that's not what came across in the books that we wrote or the speeches that I've given. Uh, and, you know, it's highly amusing to me, but trust me, you know, I, it's, I guess every, everybody, I don't know, it's taught today. I know it was taught in your time. And certainly in my time, one of the things you learn in math is square roots, you know? And I said it to somebody one time. I said, how many times have you taken a square root since you graduated? <laughs> and the right? answer is never cubed. Uh, 
and it is important and the formal education part and the, 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 the tools are incredibly important, but that's not the differentiator over the long haul. Absolutely. Absolutely, Tom. It is all about the people. So if, if Tom, I, I read in the book and this kind of saddens me and I hope it's not true, but you say this is your last book. So if this is your last book and let's pretend this is your last interview, what would you like to put out there for folks to hear so they get it, your last message to folks? Business, certainly nonprofits even more so, business is about people. Uh, and to be effective with your customers, your employees, you really need to care. You really need to give a damn. Uh, I refer to a speech that was given by a three-star army general whose name was Melvin Zace. And he went through the best, number one thing you can do in your career, the number one thing that will get you ahead is you must care. And it's true in the army and it's true in the Navy. <clears throat> And it's true in the two-person accountancy, and it's true in the giant company. Uh, and, and then again, relative to my age, I said to somebody one time, I only have one indicator of my life. When I walk by a mirror, do I barf? And, you know, the question is, how did you help others? How did you support others? Who are the people who royally pissed you off because they they left and then went on to this incredible career because of the fact that you had really helped them develop, um, and and that's that's the scorecard, and you know, and it is, you know, I don't darken many church doors, even though I was raised uh, a Presbyterian, and this is not the kind of words I use. Uh, it's spiritual in a way. And that's with a lowercase s. It has nothing to do with, you know, Catholicism or Judaism or Baptistism or whatever any of the isms. It's, uh, it's human beings helping other human beings. And, you know, you and I are having this conversation in early February 2021. And my greatest prayer Bill, is that a lot of people who really have gone out of their way to help others, leaders helped others during the pandemic, I hope it's contagious and it will carry over. I hope we'll see this thoughtfulness that we are seeing more regularly uh, carry over. Yeah, and, uh, I do too, Tom. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Well, nobody can accuse you of not caring, Tom. You're always passionate about putting people first and about searching for this excellence, especially right now. And you are one of the kindest people that I know. And I'm just fortunate that I've gotten to spend some time with you today. You've shared a lot of great stuff, but you got to care a lot before anything changes. And I'll, I'll say, Tom, those four letters, those will be around long after you do. That is your legacy, my friend. And thank you no, for thank you. sharing some of it with you're, me today. You're far too kind. It's true. So thank you, Tom. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Hopefully you got some great stuff. Care a lot. Make a difference. Aspire to manage great people and be one yourself. Be excellent now. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. So I'm going to.